Hello everybody, I'm the Chief Investment Officer of the Advisor Centre and today we're going to be uh, discussing what the markets are telling us. Four key topics for today. We've got some perspectives on the macroeconomic environment. We've got an overview of asset markets generally. We're going to have a little look at the possible preferences between assets and then some sector preferences. And then finally, just, just a few words on ESG. We'll start with the big picture if we can. Uh, our central case and then two other possible scenarios to discuss and this is very much influencing how fund managers are thinking. So statement of the blindingly obvious, uh, easy money remains the order of the day. Uh, central bankers are keeping financial conditions extremely loose. Uh, the goal, the intention, the stated intention in fact is to see the inflation rate rise. Some of you will realise this has been the 10 year theme of trying to actually put inflation into the system, um, but explicitly um, post particularly uh, the events of COVID, there is a very clear intention of seeing um, a rising inflation rate. I think the fear of deflation, which is after all what gripped the global economy in the 1930s, is so overwhelming, there is a desire to make sure that does not happen. Uh, eventually, that will lead to interest rates rising rather than as they are today, static or indeed falling. Um, let's look at the Federal Reserve, the most powerful bank in the world. The monetary policy now, there was QE, but that QE is now being set very differently. It's being set for the poorest people in the poorest states in America. In other words, and we are going to use this phrase a lot, I think, in the next few years, the battle has moved from the war on Corona to, to the war on inequality. And if you look at the um, election of Biden, if you look at the main policy stances of, of the Biden presidency so far, and indeed the Democratic Congress, you're seeing it is the war on in inequality that's, that's dominating the, the, the conversations. Let's just assume that that is the central case. If we look further through to two other possible scenarios, we go, they keep printing money, they do the QE, which we've been doing for a long time now. And despite changing the words about how they intend targeting the stimulus, i.e. it'll be far more than before, which it indeed has been, not much changes. Um, you have monetary stimulus, you have fiscal stimulus, but the disinflationary forces remain firmly ensconced and they're in charge. Um, Unfortunately, that would mean the 2020s, the decade of the 20s, looks a lot like the previous decade, which basically is a period of relatively low growth and sadly uh, rising inequality still. Third option, as plausible as the, perhaps the previous one, an inflationary blip, boom. We're effectively witnessing the end of Reaganomics. For those of you who have not disposed to understand that particular aspect, Reaganomics was about removing or slimming down the size of the government and the interference by the government uh, in, the, in the economy. If we live in a market economy, prior to Reagan, you've moved into a situation, even in America, top rates of tax or taxes were north of 80%. So there was very much a government control, um, much more than there has been really since the liberalization of that process under Reaganomics, Thatcherism and, and an even Blair and beyond. Um, what Biden is saying is big government is back. And of course, coronavirus has provided the backdrop for that. To asset markets, the implications from any of those scenarios, if you work in the central scenario even, um, you can still see that bonds have had an amazing bull market. 40 years to be absolutely precise. 1981 was the effective peak of yields around the world. If you take uh, the gilt indexes, you take the treasury market in the US, um, very high double digit bond yields. You've spent or you've seen nearly 40 years of inflation control of slim down government. And what's happened is the targeting of inflation that's bought bond yields substantially lower. As people have more confidence in less inflation in the future, um, they will give a higher value to the bonds. Hence, the yields have fallen. What's been the beneficiary of that? It's been beneficiary to bonds and bond proxy equities, as well as long duration growth assets. So the effect of the bond that you move has to be to favour, particularly in the last 10 years, clearly, your bond your proxies, think Unilever, and your growth assets, think of the FANGs, think of Facebook, Apple, etc., and, and the equivalents in, in the likes of China, Alibaba, Tencent, etc. So the very low nominal bond yields and very tight credit spreads are very much uh, the order of the day. And that does mean the opportunities for, for returns from fixed income, if you're going to look at a total return in particular, are somewhat more challenging. In equities, it's been a one-way bet. 
declining bond yields and easy money has meant exactly what we said about uh, from the bond slide, which is effectively that uh, you buy bond proxies, buy longer duration companies with longer duration assets. More recently, it's been manifesting itself as buy companies with no profits. And you've all seen the excitement of the last six months in the US with the um, paychecks largely going into the uh, stock market. Pandemic has actually in a huge government interventions, played into the narrative of inequality, um, which is very apparent um, in this crisis. And hence, the stimulus is being applied is really interesting for equities and we'll come on to that in a second. Thinking about equities in the medium term, there are tectonic shifts we believe, back to the Reaganomics mm -hmm. argument, we think the monetary and fiscal policy around the world is changing. It does have implications for asset markets. The tone and the nature of the way in which they wish uh, to direct the economy is going to have a bearing on assets moving forward. What do we think you should do in this regard? What, what's the response to, to, to the assets you could um, buy for your clients? Bonds, it's very limited opportunity set. Limited because the yields are so low. The yields are low in terms of how low government bond yields are in the developed world, even in the developing world. And that also it ties in with the spreads, the money you can get from investment grade bonds above and beyond sovereign spreads are 150, that's 1.5% to those of us in old money to 2% over guilt. Um, it's, it's, it's not a huge uh, number and the reality of the situation is total return off the back of that yield is going to be very hard to achieve. I think yield hungry investors are going to have to take higher levels of credit risk to get their income I'm afraid and that means there's more capital volatility. But where you can pick a fund flexibility is going to be the key so I think flexible dynamic fund managers in bonds particularly. In equities um, you can't have a completely clear view of the economic environment this year. We do not know the pace of the um, unlocking from Corona. It's varying regionally anyway. Think about Europe versus the US at the moment in particular as examples of, of how challenging that is. And in fact, um, China has made an explicit policy goal having boomed last year to slow their economy down. So it is not a one dimensional market at all. So if inflation as well becomes a reality uh, and secular in nature, so we're going to see an inflation spike this year. It's just year on year comparisons with last year. It's just whether that becomes secular or not. That will also need a different way of investing. And you've seen in the last six months, the value stocks, the companies that benefit from the reopening, the companies that have been ignored by the market due to low interest rates like the banking sector. And the companies that are massively underowned, like energy, have really been the mainstays of, of the recovery of the last three months. And actually, the index levels um, have actually hidden a massive rotation underneath between value and growth. We think that the most important thing to be looking at probably is the companies with good operational leverage, preferably low levels of debt. Because the one thing we do think will happen in the next two to three years, even possibly this year, is borrowing costs are going to likely rise. If the intention is to increase the inflation rate, that is going to increase the cost of capital at a company. So you're going to have to think about that. And to think about that means you're going to have to think about the companies you buy. It's interesting at the moment, actually. Um, it means growth and value managers are, are probably at the margin bereft of ideas. I think the value run has been so strong, you need to see the reality of the opening up for those value managers to have done well. And growth managers knew that their stocks were expensive. And they also knew that the momentum was against them. They had a very good year last year. The year and year comparisons are going to be hard for them. So overall, we're not sure about the opening. We're not sure about how quickly that will happen. It's varying regionally. The stimulus is still there. So absolutely for this year, the balance is between the more natural growth style that's been in favour for a number of years. But that has to be and continuously complemented this year, certainly by, by a degree of investment in value managers. The last piece of um, this conversation is ESG, um, our, our, an update um, as we see it. The um, SFDR regulations in Europe um, have focused minds of the fund management groups. There's no question about that. Um, for those that don't know, it is about declaring which um, the flavour of your um, ESG integration within the funds that you have in, 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 in the um, European Union. Um, so the Luxembourg funds, the Dublin funds, etc., have had to declare and they've had to declare what article they are. The articles are listed for your own benefit here, but um, it's basically, are you ESG integrated? Are you exclusively sustainable? Or are you a hybrid of the two? They're commonly known as Article 6, 8 and 9. 
fund groups have been selecting where they feel their funds fit um, in the last few months into these into these uh, let's call them buckets. Uh, UK unit trusts are, are will be following in a, a degree of a similar vein. Obviously, advisors are now having to ask questions in the country about um, the approach to sustainable investing for their clients. So you'll see a, a, a follow through and a wash through uh, into the UK unit trust universe. But advisors have to think about, I think, distinguishing funds what they're saying to you, what kind of client you have, and you'll see much more information flowing from the fund groups um, in, in, in the next few months about the, um, the nature of the ESG integration or otherwise of their funds. It's going to continue to gain traction as a, um, and the momentum to address the climate change is clearly there. It's mandated by governments. It's actually regulatory policies as well. So the green audit company's behaviour is being looked at continuously. So I think the very simplest way to think about it is most most funds we think will do uh, ESG integration at an Article 6 level, the current funds that you understand today. Some will be pushing for Article 8. Just to be clear, that's 50% of your investments are for environmentally good purposes or for sustainable purposes. And there is obviously going to be the dedicated vehicles, which will be the Article 9 versions of the world. That clarity will be very helpful. It'll allow you to decide whether you wish to be an engaged ESG investor or an exclusion based ESG investor. So I think much more clarity as the months progress on this, um, which will be welcomed by everybody. I hope that's been useful um, and we look forward to giving you a further update uh, in, in the coming months. As a reminder, um, the Advisor Centre is a fund and investment research service. Um, it's a service free to financial advisors from a team with a distinguished heritage in this field. It's uh, free to use. It's an online research service. It incorporates a panel of funds to populate client portfolios. The additional materials are bulletins on those funds, uh, an overview of the uh, IA sectors, uh, a monthly viewpoint, guidance pieces, uh, both fund and market orientated, and uh, a variety of different articles. We also offer consulting services. Uh, we have many years of experience in consulting. We help clients with fund selection, portfolio construction, and of course, your central investment propositions. If you have any questions on any of the above, please do feel free to contact us at info at theadvisorcentre.co.uk. Thank you again.